This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now I am so friggin' excited for today's show because I will be talking to musician Jim Walker. He did, he wrote and performed the theme song to the teen cult classic, Three O'Clock High, Something to Remember Me By, such a great memorable song, I just love it, it's such a catchy, catchy tune. And um, he had started out in a band called Lost Anthony. They were a very quirky pop band. And after they broke up, he did that song. And then he went on to collaborate with Rick Murata on many um, film and TV projects. You know, he did the um, song In My Arms for one of my favorite horror movies of all time, Mirror, Mirror. And according to his website, he did music for Tales from the Crypt, but it doesn't specify what, so I'm going to ask him about that. And he also did the uh, Chad McQueen movie, Red Line, and uh, he had a duo with Tim Ellis, the late Tim Ellis, called Tim and Jim. And uh, he has a new album out called I'm Gonna Say Hi, and we're going to get into all that stuff today, and I can't wait. I I love listening to other podcasts because it always gives me the incentive to reach out to people that are not in my on that are not on my radar in the moment, you know, and Jim was has been on uh, the two dollar late fee podcast a few times. And that's what put him on my radar, even though I love that song, something to remember me by right, that it would have really, really done something to remember to reach out to him. And I was going to reach out to him last October, November, November ish. Um, but he did he did their show for the 35th anniversary at three o'clock high, and then I ended up getting Stacy Glick. So this works out just fine. I was going to have him on the show either way, and it's going to be awesome as hot August summer is about to end. So yeah, here is my interview with Jim Walker. Tommy. Hey, Jim. Welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? I'm excellent. How are you doing? I am fantastic. This is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, it's nothing. Come on. (laughs) So, going back in time, what age did you start gravitating toward music? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Well, I was was a huge, uh, like, you know, fanatical music listener when I was a kid. Like, loved pop radio. Grew up in L.A. and I Mm -hmm. listened to all the pop radio stations and stuff like that, but I would say about uh, eight, I wanted to play an instrument. And I wanted to play guitar, but my Mm -hmm. parents wanted me to play something that was more like a real instrument, so they made me play the violin for a couple years, which I hated every second of. And (laughs) then I got to play the the big acoustic bass, big stand-up acoustic bass, which I liked a little bit better, but it was tough to drag around. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I was, finally after I did that, when I was 11, my parents uh, were kind enough to give me guitar lessons and give me a little acoustic guitar, and that kind of got me rolling. Nice, nice. <laughs> so how, how many instruments overall do you play? Uh, some would argue none. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I would say guitar is my main instrument, and I can play um, a little bass, a little piano, little drums if I have to. Mm-hmm. Uh, stuff like that, mostly just for for context and color, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. I can make something smell like something if I have to. Like I, I, I remember I did the soundtrack to a movie about a guy who lived out on a farm, and I bought a banjo and a mandolin and learned just enough to make that kind of sound in the <laughs> during the song. So it was like, oh, that's a mandolin. That kind of sounds like a farm. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did you come from a musical family? Um, my dad was a trumpet player, mm-hmm. and uh, he, I don't know if he was good or not, he never played it when I was around, I just knew that he had played trumpet, and apparently he got good enough where at some point he was playing in a, some kind of combo with Chet Baker, and uh, I'm trying to, Ron Carter, the bass player, Ron Carter, some little jazz thing, and because he used to talk about those guys all the time, but um, I never heard him play, so other than that, there was just a lot of... Uh, kind of 50s pop in the house, a lot of big band stuff. That was my dad's kind of love. Right. Those those things. (laughs) Uh, Do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? I do. It was Alice Cooper, 
Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> oh, I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan. Huge. Oh, really? I got all the albums, you know, and, like, I know the lyrics to all his songs. I mean, I worship Alice. He was my first, like, real legit concert, too. No way! That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I just like the... Because you used to be able to go to... When I was a kid, you'd go to the, the market, you know, like the grocery store, and they would have a section yeah. for albums, just like they have a section for, like, a magazine rack. And so I remember seeing that Alice Cooper album, and I was like, Mom, can I have this? And she's like, no. And I'd bug her every time I went to the market with her. Finally, she... I think it was three ninety nine. But I remember that uh, I had to bug her for a while, but I got my way. Your constant, you know... Just constant badgering. Yeah, this is such a great album, too. Uh, how about your first concert? Kiss. Kiss. Uh, the Love Gun Tour, 1976. I was 11 years old. That was actually 77. Oh, it was? Yeah. Love Gun was 77. Love Gun was 70. Okay, so 77. So you're a Kiss fan, too. Apparently. Oh, yes. Huge Kiss fan. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, so I guess I was 12. But, yeah, that, and Cheap Trick opened. Oh, yeah. And so Cheap Trick was actually my first concert, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw them in 2000, and Rick Nielsen uh, took his gun, took his guitar off uh, in the middle of the solo and gave it to a guy in the wheelchair in the front row. Oh, my God. Yeah. Amazing. And then, are, they're, still, they're still so good. I mean, they're so good. Oh yeah, they're still out there like every year, like like almost every day of the year playing, and they're putting their set lists on their Facebook page. It's just amazing that they they keep going like that. Rick Nielsen is, is like the oldest one of all of them. Like he's getting close to eighty now. No way, really? I yeah, guess, uh, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So was was your first band in high school? Uh, yeah, uh, I I played with another guy. When we were in junior high, just kind of, you know, it's like two electric guitars just making racket. But we got, I started a band in high school called Winter Rose. Mm. <laughs> that sound good? Um, yeah. And we were doing stuff like, uh, I mean, it was kind of all over the place. It was just stuff we liked. But um, we were writing some original things. But we, one guy really liked Steely Dan. One guy really liked Rush. One guy really liked Zeppelin. You know, so we were all kind of like, yeah, sure. So we did this big mishmash of stuff. And uh, it was very fun. A good learning experience. So, so you went through a heavy metal phase. I, I, yeah, I mean, I love a lot of that stuff still. Mm -hmm. I totally dug that stuff. Uh, I mean, I was like, you know, it was like Zeppelin, Aerosmith, Sabbath, and along with Pink Floyd and those kind of things. The kind of, you know, what's considered classic rock that was actually on the radio when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then I got really into like a kind of a... When I heard Steely Dan, mm -hmm. like, I really got, I fell into that, and I got kind of into this, you know, I really need to learn the guitar better. I got to really come up with at least one chop here. <laughs> and so I, I got really into jazz, really into that kind of stuff, and convinced myself that I really didn't like all that other stuff that I grew up with. And I hit a certain point, and I was like, wait, why can't this all be one thing? Why do I have to, like, turn my back on something? You know, why, why can't I just incorporate this into that? And uh, so, yeah, I kind of, you know, I like everything. That, that's interesting how you, you wanted to become a better guitar player because of Steely Dan. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's like, because they were doing stuff where I was like, I was listening to guys like Ian Parks and Larry Carlton and the guys that they would have play guitar and so Denny Diaz, Jeff Baxter, all these amazing guitar players, including Walter Becker. Yep. And I was like, man, oh man, these guys like, they do things that the other guys, they just go directions the other guys don't go. And yeah. I think it's just more of like a, a, a different kind of knowledge of, of chords and music and, you know, musicality. So it just, it just kind of changed my, my view of that stuff a little bit. Uh, they were the thinking man's jazz rock band. <laughs> they were. And I know some people hate their guts. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of those out there. <laughs> Were, were, were you a yeah. UFO guy? What? Uh, were you into UFO? Oh, you know, I loved uh, um, Is Lights Out. Uh, yeah, it's oh. a great album. Yeah, that, that's kind of like, I think I kind of like got into that and that was kind of it. But um, 
Yeah, you know what's funny is I just recently rebought that album probably within the last seven months, and I haven't heard it in 40 years, so. <laughs> wow. Like, this is awesome, man. Yeah, uh, Obsessions and their live album, Strangers and Night, those three are just the, the, the their absolute best, I feel. It was like right at the peak of, of Michael Schenker before he left and he formed his band, MSG. So. Huh? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that band. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, I mean, he still tours with them occasionally, and he does his, he, he'll do solo tours. Well, he, he'll do 30 songs from, like, you know, each band he was in. He'll do, like, you know, four or five songs from each band on his tour. It's crazy how much energy he has. Wow, that's incredible. It is amazing when you go to see some of these, you know, older bands now. Mm -hmm. You know, they just have this wealth of music to draw from. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love that. I think it's great. Oh, here's one. Here's one from 50 years ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Well, you know, I mean, no one makes money in record sales anymore, so they have to tour now, which is uh -huh. sad. Don't I know it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what year do you form Lost Anthony? <laughs> Lost Anthony was probably 85. Mm hmm. Um, just four guys, kind of, kind of goofing around. And we just had another one of those sort of personality crisis kind of bands where one guy was into the Eagles, mm -hmm. one guy was into Kate Bush, one guy was into like kind of current pop music, whatever was on the radio, Police or something like that at the time. Yeah. And I was into like Zappa. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, and, and so we just had this, a real identity kind of crisis. And, uh, uh, but it was just still a really fun band, very eclectic. And we, we just held together for five or six years, I think. Played all over L.A. and had a, a really good time, and then it just kind of just kind of faded out at a certain point. Just like, eh. Yeah, I, I listened to the band's songs on your YouTube channel. They were, they were very um, eclectic in sound. I mean, there's there's no way to describe their sound. It's kind of like the Guess Who, you know? They, 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 all, they did all these different sounds, not just one, you know? Dude, you are really, like, you're, you're in my head. Because I was just <laughs> listening to Guess Who going... How could you describe this band? It, yeah. <laughs> Ian Heavy, he's my brother. Uh, you know, Long Cool Woman. Mm -hmm. You know? It just, it's like so, so completely eclectic. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I I, I, I really like things like that. I mean, I think my, probably my all-time two favorite albums would probably be the Beatles' White Album and The Wall. Oh, yeah. It just, just because it's so, there's so many kinds of music over those those you know those albums it's just incredible I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a defender of the White Album a lot of people say that's not a real Beatles album it's just them doing solo shit because they were mad at each other it's like maybe so but it's still a great album yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I love all that stuff yeah um, I listened to Closed Door it reminded me of Elvis Costello's Radio Radio was that an influence? I was, that was when I was really into Elvis Costello. That that band was definitely Elvis Costello uh, influenced. Mm -hmm. I was it, it was really when I first started like tr trying to write lyrics. Yeah. Because before that, I just was you know uh, I love her, she loves me. It's the springtime, whatever. And I was actually like when I f first heard Elvis Costello, I thought it was I didn't like it. It was uh -huh. too much going, too much going on for me. And every party I'd go to, everybody would scream the lyrics when the songs came on, and I was like, I'm, this is not my thing at all. And then I think I was driving around somewhere, and I heard the song Man Out of Time from Imperial Bedroom, and it really hit me what a great songwriter the guy was, and then I kind of fell backwards into all the rest of it. And uh, that's when I, yeah, I was really into lyrics. So the, Lost Anthony was me trying to write lyrics for the first time, <laughs> trying to write songs about stuff. Wow, yeah, uh, Sleep Tight has a nice little jazzy piano sound. It kind of reminds me of Bruce Hornsby a little bit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, our, our keyboard player, Eric, he was really, oh, he's way too good for the band. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was so good. He was like a classical player. And uh, you know, he was, we, we were always just like, every time that a musical question came up, it was like, um, Eric, how do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was he was fantastic. Still is. Yeah, the the next apartment uh, is very doo-woppy. Uh huh. 
yeah, you guys d did some pretty interesting music. Uh, did you guys play the uh, the whiskey or any of the famous clubs in L.A.? We didn't play the whiskey, but we played uh, Madame Wong's back in the day. Mm -hmm. Madame Wong's both east and west. And uh, let's see, Club 88, which is a kind of an old punk club. Um, yeah. But for some reason, we, we went, went over okay in, in punk clubs. Because our stuff was just too weird, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so people were like, okay, well, I can stand this for 45 minutes. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, Coconut Teaser, uh, yeah, a lot of the ones that were around back then. Yeah, who did you guys see around? As far as other bands? Yeah. That was like when uh, when the, the hair bands really were, were going. Like, the punk scene was kind of getting kicked out and you'd have... You know, like the bands that were like Cinderella and Poison, yeah, and that kind of stuff. And so all the it was a really weird time. Like, it just things were just shifting during that time. Really interesting musically, and and MTV had kind of just started. So like, you know, like just culture, pop culture just changed super super quick all of a sudden. You know, right. much much like it is now, but it hadn't been that way up to then. Yeah, I mean, L.A. had all these organic scenes of, of music. It was such a magical time. You had the hair metal guys, the the, the punk guys, or the the uh, the Paisley Underground, like uh, Dream Syndicate and the Bengals mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I used to work, I used to work security during that time uh, mm -hmm. for this company called Event Management, and so I I saw so many shows, like big shows at the Universal Amphitheater and the Forum and that kind of stuff. It just, you know, and I was just always amazed at how much interesting stuff was going on. You know, yeah. <laughs> how many different kinds of bands were out playing. Fun. It was such a show busy town back then, in L.A. Yeah, uh, where, are you, where are you at? I uh, born and raised in uh, San Mateo, but uh, I live in Modesto currently. Oh, cool! American Graffiti, right? I'm sorry. American Graffiti. Oh yeah, uh, it was partially shot here, and it was also. Uh, it was mainly shot in San Rafael. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of, of both places. Uh, did you guys see Lone Justice around? They, they were one of my favorite bands. Yeah. I, I loved Maria McKee. I've, I've had her on the show. She's an absolute sweetheart. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. It's great. Um, yeah, I was. I actually met her away from the show one time. I, I saw her shooting a video um, on the Sunset Strip with Lone Justice kind of before they broke. Yeah. But I knew who they were, and uh, I talked to her, and she was super, super nice, and I sent her a, a DM on, on Instagram, kind of reminding her about this conversation, not that I thought she'd remember, but just how much it meant to me at the time, and she was just so nice, you know, she just came back, and she's like, boy, she goes, I'm so glad I was nice, because I was such a brat back then, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I used to love seeing them, their, their shows were, it, they all depended on her mood, Yeah. So if she was in a good mood, man. They were just great. And if she was kind of in a crappy mood, it just like slogged along. She just looked <laughs> bummed to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did you guys see Eric Lone and Dan Navarro? No, never did. Okay, I've talked to Dan Navarro. Uh, did you guys get signed to a label? No, although um, I got signed super briefly to Geffen mm -hmm. uh, and the RCA. And before we could get anything together to make a record, they decided it probably wasn't a good fit. Uh, they, everyone had this uh, this theory that if you were from L.A., you shouldn't be making a record in L.A. Like, uh. they, the, the standard speech I got was, you know the last band that got signed that lived in L.A.? Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, so can't there be another one? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, that was fine. It all worked out how yeah. it worked out, so. That is weird. I mean, I mean, you guys were around during that, the heyday of IRS records, and they were signing all the indie bands that were out at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I loved all that stuff. Yeah, I can't believe they didn't show any, any interest in you guys, at least. I sent them demos over and over again. <laughs> wow. Miles Copeland, right? When I who ran that label. Yeah, uh, Miles Copeland, and um, they had a uh, they had a deal. Uh, I think it was a distribution deal with A and M. Right. 
you know, because uh, he brought them the police, and so that it, so then they're like, you know, doing a coexistence um, production thing. Yeah. Wow. So when you guys broke up, was it a mutual decision? It was. It really kind of just we stopped rehearsing and then stopped communicating. It was. It was kind of like it just sort of faded away. It was kind of sad, but I think everyone kind of felt the same way. Like this is this has kind of run its course. Mm-hmm. And. Um, I mean, I stayed friends with everybody, so that was good. We just, instead instead of playing music, we just went to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys were together, what, four or five years then? Yes, about six. And, six. Uh, and we had a, a lot of drummer, we had a couple of drummer lineup changes. And I remember that there was a guy who, re- I think it was the, during the Geffen time, the guy who was a, my A&R guy at Geffen was like, look, you know, mm-hmm. I don't think you should have a keyboard player in the band. I think you should have another guitar player. And I was like, ah, you know, so my other, my best friend in the band was the keyboard player. So he's telling me basically like I should kick the, <laughs> my best friend out of the band. <laughs> and so it's one of those decisions like, well, is this, a, is this a business or is this, you know, a band of a bunch of guys that have been together for a long time and then, you know, are friends. And we ended up, trying another guitar player Mm -hmm. and everything felt wrong about it just the vibe felt wrong it felt like a betrayal to the keyboard player and this was about the time that I was thinking this is this is all fine and good but this is not for me Mm -hmm. you know if you want to make these kind of you know executive decisions where someone's got to be cut out of the band you know I, I don't have the stomach for it yeah wow now we we know how inaccurate IMDb can be at times, but did you write the song Soul Beat for almost you? <laughs> no, that's a, everything is wrong on that page. It's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> it would be cool if you did because I love that movie. I'm I'm like one of the few people out there who's actually seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's you know that's, there's a, oh, so many Jim Jim Walkers and James Walkers and stuff. Mm-hmm. I get you know, cross reference with them a lot especially this one uh, jazz flute player named James Walker uh-huh. I used to get calls like I used to get his calls from the union like okay you need to be at a session at uh, you know at Capitol Records at 10 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday and I'm like what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like what, what are you giving me a deal just out of the blue? <laughs> yeah. and bring all your flutes huh? <laughs> bring all your flutes <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I may have found that Jim Walker when I was doing research because I did find a couple that weren't you. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as, as much as I try to you know send them you know the right information and stuff, it never seems to get changed. So I just it is what it is. Same thing. There's another um, you know I use I use JVA kind of for my all my music now, uh, just the initials. And there's another band in Germany called mm-hmm. JVA, which is something about like it's like a joke kind of. It's like the juvenile. Uh, youth Juvenile uh, associ- Association or something like that, like juvenile delinquents. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but they're like sort of a, a, a like a kind of European dance band thing. Yeah. And I keep getting statements that say your song, you know, uh, Aquamarine had three thousand plays on Spotify, and I was like, that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a there's a Tommy Kovac who's a graphic artist and I get mistaken for him all the time and oh, really? <laughs> yeah there was this one uh, person I was trying to get on the show for a long time and she uh, she ended up changing her mind and I found out it was because she thought that I was him and she saw a picture that that, that he drew that offended her right but then um, th- there was a mutual friend of ours that set her straight and then she ended up coming on and we had an absolute blast and she felt bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's so weird. Yeah, it's 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 really weird. So so, what's the genesis of something to remember me by? Well, let's see. Uh, so, I knew the director Phil. Uh, his sister was friends with my sister. So so, she told me that he was making a movie, and and that was no surprise because Phil was a couple years older than me, and everybody kind of in town. I grew up in La Cunada, mm-hmm. and uh, everybody 
kind of knew who he was. He was this kid. He was like tons of energy. He was always going around making these like Super 8 movies or 16 millimeter movies and stuff and getting all these people to, you know, just do stuff with him. And he just had this natural kind of leadership ability. And she told me that he was going to make this movie because uh, he was going to USC and he needed to do a final project. And, um, and I was like, oh, okay. And she said, yeah, I, I think you'd be good for this, this part that he's trying to cast for the, uh, the main guy's best friend. Mm-hmm. And so she put that bug in his ear and he called me up and said, yeah, come down to USC and we'll do an audition. So I went down, did the audition, got the part. And, uh, <laughs> and then we just kind of became friends and I was teaching him, I was, uh, he played a little guitar. And so I was giving him guitar lessons. And that's when he got the deal to do Three O'Clock High. Mm-hmm. And um, he told me, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm having this band is going to do something in it. Tom Petty is supposed to write a song for it. Oh. Big Country, if you remember those guys. Big Country is oh. going to write a song oh, for yeah. it. And Thompson Twins are writing a song for it. And I went, oh, cool, that's great. And he goes, I, I wish I could, you know, say that I could get one of your songs in the movie. But he goes, this is my first film and I don't really have any control over anything like that. And I went, don't, don't even worry about it, that's fine. Anyway, these uh, all these bands submitted songs. And... Meanwhile, Phil said, you know what? Just for fun, here's like the dummy scene for the beginning of the movie. Yeah. It's a video, short video of it. Why don't you try to write something for it? And I went, okay. With no pressure at all, right? So <laughs> I just I wrote that song. And I played it for him. He goes, man, this is better than all those other songs. Wow. Like, really? And he goes, yeah, but I still, there's nothing I can do about it. So his executive producer at the time was Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. So I guess... Spielberg heard the other songs and they put him up against the first scene in the movie and he was like, do you like these songs, Phil? And he went, not really. Goes, yeah, some of, some of them is not really working. And he goes, yeah. He goes, well, you got any other ideas? And he said, well, my friend wrote this song <laughs> and he pulled this cassette out and Spielberg listened to it and he goes, that's the song. Yeah. So that was pretty exciting. God, yeah, it, it, that is mind-boggling uh, considering that Spielberg, he took his, his name off the credits when the movie was released, which still boggles my mind to this day. Right, yeah, it's just too dark for him or something. That, that, that's very interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that song is one of the most recognizable teen movie theme songs. Like, it ranks up there with modern problem or modern English's I Melt With You or Simple Minds, Don't, don't You Forget About Me. You know, I, I hate drawing comparisons, but when I hear the song, I hear flourishes of the plimsolls, the psychedelic furs, the police, and ecstasy. Were, were they any influences? All of that stuff. I loved all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, and thank you. That was a, that's really nice of you to say. Um, oh, yeah. I, I loved that, that particular guitar type of sound back then. You know, all the bands mm-hmm. you named, Plimsolls, Smithereens, Police, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. And um, my, my demo of it was, you know, I was playing guitar on it and stuff like that. But when we actually went to cut the tune, uh, they had, they told me that the band was going to be uh, Rick Murata, who was one of my favorite drummers. He played like drums on Hank by Steely Dan. <laughs> and, uh, and Blue by You by Linda Ronstadt. And a whole bunch of John Lennon stuff. And oh my God, the guy's you know, done a million records. And I was like, really? I saw him? Cool. And, uh, and then they were going to have this guy, Mike Landau, who's an amazing guitar player. He's another session guy. And then they said they were going to have Andy Summers come in and play guitar too. So I was like, oh, okay. And uh, the Andy Summers thing never worked out. It didn't really matter because the other guys just covered everything and were so good. Mm-hmm. And I was just, you know, I was so young and totally green and I was just kind of standing there going, I can't believe this is happening. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, but I had, I had just seen Mike Landau play with Joni Mitchell mm-hmm. like the year before. So I got the total fanboy, you know, on him. I, you, know, you know, when you play with Joni Mitchell, it's like Chris Farley with Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you did you make a music video for it? No. Mm-mm. Yeah. It, it it should it should have been like a huge huge hit. You know. I mean, Three Clock High is such a great movie. I don't know why it didn't do as well as it did. I wish you were in charge of stuff, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People have told me I have an eye for talent. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird because um. You know, it was, it was such 
major big movie, and it was you know Universal Studios. Mm-hmm. And when it, um, it they put all this money behind it, and all this stuff, it was going to be released, you know, with all the like fall movies. And I remember it did really well the first weekend, and then just attendance just dropped off, and the thing just kind of died. And we we're all like, oh, well, that's too bad. Mm-hmm. And literally, that's the last. Like last I heard about that movie, kind of until, because that you know there was no internet back then. <laughs> yeah. So up until I would say right around dial-up modem, kind of 1998, sort of that that general beginning of the internet kind of stuff, and uh, I started to get these emails and stuff from people that were like, "Are you the guy that did that song for that movie? I really like that song." And, hey, thanks a lot, man. Um. And then people started to do, you know, websites about movies and things like that. And I started to get people, more people asking me that stuff. And then, you know, it just kind of, it took on this, this kind of cultish life of its own. And the people like you that really liked that movie, they really liked that movie. And other people, like, you know, I'll say, have you ever seen that movie? And they're like, never heard of it. Uh- <laughs> Oh, yeah, and there's also Zach and Paul on $2 Late Fee, you know, who you've given permission to use the, the, the song as their theme and stuff, you know. Yeah. That, that, that's how you, 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 uh, you came back on my radar after so long, because I started listening to the podcast and stuff, and I like what, what Zach and Paul do. It, it, it's, it's funny, um, I, I, I remember early last year, I reached out to Stacy Glick, who played the younger sister in Three O'Clock yeah. High, and I finally heard from her like around the time that I, I heard uh, you and Juwanu on two dollar late fee, because I was gonna I was gonna reach out to you a, a, as a last resort if uh, if, if she never uh, you know uh, re- reached out to me, and she ended up doing it, and it was a good interview. But we had so many technological difficulties that I had to do a lot of editing, and she heard it later, and she was like, "Oh my God, this is a miracle! How how great it sounds!" Because we just kept you know uh you know losing each other and redialing and there was bad weather going on in california and in new york it was crazy wow is she still acting no she's a literary agent now in new york and um she's very successful at it she's got a lot of uh clients who are like you know uh who have books on the uh, new york uh, bestsellers lists and everything that's cool that's really cool but she's got a lot of good memories of being a child actress uh, back in the 70s and 80s that uh, she wouldn't trade for anything in the world. She was happy to talk about it, so. That's great. That's really cool. Yeah. So did you uh, get to go to a premiere or anything for the movie? Yeah. Went to the, I think it was at the Westwood Theater in, in, uh, in West L.A. Mm-hmm. And uh, big deal, red carpet, got to walk the red carpet. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, the, the whole cast was there. It was super fun. And you know, like, it was a really really fun time. And you know, stayed friends with a lot of the people that I had got to work with on the thing. And yeah, it was it was really just a, it was like just it, it's super exciting. You know, just a, like an exciting kind of kind of thing. Whether it sustained or not, you know, it was mm-hmm. it was super fun when it happened. Uh, Casey Samosco was there. Yeah. Yeah, he, I can imagine he's a very nice guy. As I recall, yep, yep, I, super. I interviewed his sister Nina a couple of years ago. She told me he's very reclusive now. She's like, she she goes through long periods where she doesn't even get get to talk with him. He's just very private and very introverted now. <laughs> it must be strange when you, you know, you are kind of getting, because he was in you know, the Back to the Future movies and mm-hmm. much other stuff, and... Uh, you know, it, it must be weird when you're recognized for something, but, like, you're not really doing it as much now. Yeah. So, you know, everywhere you go, someone's like, you know, hey, three o'clock high. He's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I'll just stay home. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean certain people. You know, I talk to you know, they do the comic cons now and all the conventions because the, the the comic con circuit has just blown up into something so friggin' huge that thirty years ago you would never have imagined to. You know, he doesn't do them. I don't see him on on any of the lineups and stuff. You know, I think he I think he should, but that's up to him. But like I mean, he does have that that level where like you know if he did do comic cons, you know people would be happy to come meet him. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So you ended up collaborating with uh, Rick Morata for years. Did he become like a mentor to you? Very much so. Like, 
I was such a fan of him. And uh, so when they told me he was going to be on the tune, I was like, wow. And I don't know if you know anything about Rick, but when I met him, he was about 42 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he was, he's this big, massive guy from New York. And his background is Sicilian. And he stares in your eye. He looks like Rasputin. And he's just scary as hell and funny as hell. Mm-hmm. But very intimidating guy. So when yeah. I first met him, I was like, yeah, I hope I, you know, I just hope I can hang without making a fool of myself. And somehow, I, I think he just eh, took pity on me. Oh, this poor green idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he liked my songs a lot. And so he was trying to help me get a deal after 3 o'clock high happened. And um, we, uh, that was kind of how I got um, signed with Ed Geffen and stuff like that. He really helped out mm-hmm. and introduced me to a lot of people. And um, we did a lot of work kind of kind of co-writing with people, like song doctoring for, for uh, a lot of artists at that time. Yeah. And, yeah, it's fun. Did, did you ever talk about playing drums on Yvonne Elliman's first album? No, he did. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah, I was I was looking up uh, you know all the stuff that he's done. I was like, wow, I I did a really strange interview with Yvonne Elliman a couple of years ago that never got finished. It was like midnight here in California and 10 p.m. in Hawaii when we talked, and she was taking care of her 100 year old mother at the time. I remember, and she was just you know spinning me off in this direction and that direction, you know, really taking control of the interview. And she was really sweet, too, you know. And we were going to finish it, like, the next night, but it never came. So then last year I finally just put it out there, and people have listened to it and says, yeah, that's Yvonne, (laughs) you know, and it's great. So uh, I can't complain there. I was, uh, when I was a little kid, I was madly in love with her, you know. She's still gorgeous. She still looks great. (laughs) Damn. Yeah, Damn, one of my crushes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also he also played on There Goes Ryman Simon. Yep. Yep. And that, he, I mean, mm-hmm. that's the thing that always shocked me like when I when I was working with him a lot, I would just like look at the back of a record and go, "Oh, Rick's on this. Oh, Rick's on this. Oh, Rick's on this." Okay. All right. I mean, between him and his brother Jerry, you know, Jerry played with uh, Peter Gabriel and uh-huh. Indigo Girls and 10,000 Maniacs and a million other acts and those two guys man I haven't heard that name in a long time the Indigo Girls <laughs> yeah <laughs> a lot of talent in that family oh yes and, oh and also Steely Dan stuff too like I'm sure yeah, you guys talked about that yeah I remember one day I found he had a like a closet where he just kind of chucked all of these cassettes mm-hmm. and I said what's on these things he goes I don't even know and I went well do you do you, do you want to find out? And he goes, I don't care. I said, well, can I listen to him? Because I don't know what's that. <laughs> None of them are labeled. He goes, yeah, sure. And I listened to it. It's a bunch of stuff like, you know, versions of songs that went on a record that didn't get on the record, you know, things like that, alternate versions and things. And I found this one cassette, and it was him playing the drums uh, for all these tunes for Walter Becker, um, the 11 Tracks of Whack album that he brought out, the solo album. And Rick didn't end up playing on the record, but it's him playing drums on all the songs. Like they just he just cycled out a bunch of different bands and members and stuff like that, trying to find the right combination. So there's this, you know, hour long thing with him just playing all these tunes. I'm like, this could be like, you know, this is stuff that people would love to hear. And he goes, Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. So, I, so I'm a huge fan of Mirror Mirror. I used to watch it every Halloween on Cinemax, like in the early '90s. I always thought it was, just, yeah, it was always such a bizarre horror movie to me. I I, I love it. How, how did you get involved with that movie? Let's see. Um, so when Phil did his uh, USC film, which is called Last Chance Dance, mm-hmm. the guy who shot it is this guy Robert Brinkman. Yeah. And He's a great cinematographer, and he's done tons and tons of movies. And Robert's girl, love interest at the time <laughs> was this woman, Marina Sargenti, who directed Mirror Mirror. Oh, yeah. And so he mentioned me to Marina, and then we, the three of us became friends, and uh, so she asked me to do this opening song. And, you know, she wanted, like, old-timey kind of 20s sort of tune, and 
like, okay, I'll take a walk back at it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's how that came about. That was a weird, <laughs> kind of a weird experience because I don't really know who was funding that movie, but it was really low budget. And there was never like a meeting in an office. It was always like at some guy's apartment. Yeah. And uh, when we went to do the actual recording of the song, it was some weird little eight track studio in Toluca Lake. Mm-hmm. It was like everything was kind of breaking down and falling apart, and we kind of walked in like, really? Okay, well, we'll work with what we got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah. T- there was two sisters who wrote that, uh, Annette and Gina Casco, and I was thinking about reaching out to them a few years ago for the for the 30th anniversary. I may do it this Halloween season, only because our world is getting weirder and life is too short, like, you know, maybe give it a chance. <laughs> yeah, why not? Did they, did they ever do anything else, like any other scripts or anything? I'd have to look that up. I, I'm sure that they did. I'm, I'm sure that they, you know, because they have their own website and they're, they're, they, they, they are writers, you know, so I'm, I'm sure they have written other things. Um, doing anything right now because there's a strike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to do an interview. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like In My Arms a lot. It's got this 30s jazz and vaudeville kind of uh, ring to it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. No fun to do. Were, were you the voice of, of Father Jeffries? Yeah, I think I, think I had one line in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was that, that's what I mean. Like it was one of those movies where someone would go like, "Oh, um, hey, we need uh, we need something to do a line on this. Um, can you just speak this line into a tape recorder?" And they pull up a cassette recorder, and I go, "Hello," and then it's in, they take that, and put it in the movie. <laughs> just weird <laughs> stuff like that. Did you do music for Tales from the Crypt? Yeah, with Rick. Uh, we mm-hmm. did a, an episode called Werewolf Concerto. Ah. Uh. That was uh, that was a really fun one. I remember I because I, I wanted it to be like sort of like the music for the Omen, Jerry Goldsmith. Oh yeah. So I was studying, not studying, but I was I was kind of woodshedding. I guess would be on sort of Gregorian chants and. Uh, uh, it's old religious music and stuff like that. So that's how we recorded it. We recorded like these four part weird vocal things along with synthesizers and drums. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like the way that music came out. Huh. I, I don't remember that episode. I have to check it out. I'm looking it up though. It's got Timothy Dalton and Dennis Farina in it. Yeah, and uh, what's her face from uh, Beverly D'Angelo? Beverly D'Angelo, yeah. And a guy named Steve Perry directed it, but not the Steve Perry from Journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, Charles. We, we got a lot of weird little little uh, things like that. Scoring, you know, episodes of TV shows. Uh, you know, just a, a bunch of little things like that. So, you know, it's kind of what I do now. I do so, a lot of TV commercials and, uh, you know, music for documentaries and for uh, whatever whatever anybody wants, you know. I do my own stuff, and then I just do stuff for, when somebody says, hey, do you have something for this? I'll try to figure it out, you know. Yeah, well, you, you, you know, things worked out at the right time for you, because guys like Danny Elfman really opened the doors for rock musicians to score movies and stuff. Man, what a talented guy. Yeah, like, I, I can't think of one before him who was doing that. I mean, uh, there were guys who were doing that, but not as successful as he was, you know. I mean, he really, like, kicked open the door for it. Yeah, I mean, he can do, and, and he's got that kind of uh, musicality where he can do pretty much any kind of music you need. Yeah, like I've talked to Don Peake, who was a who was a Wrecking Crew member, and he did the music for The Hills Have Eyes and a oh. couple other horror movies. Yeah, like, like he comes to mind as a guy that was doing that. Right, and like, in a different way, though, like Randy Newman, you know, like his, his first score was The Natural. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but it, but it sounds like Randy Newman music. You know, a lot yeah. of his scores, they're very uh, yeah. <laughs> string or, or and, and or, orchestra kind of oriented. Yeah, very um, New Orleans kind of Dixie exactly. music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't really imagine a Randy Newman score with like, you know, kick-ass metal tune in it or anything. <laughs> Did you do music for uh, the Fred Walton TV movie Dead Air? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't even I don't even remember much about that. I, I I like that movie. It should have been a theatrical movie. It's that good. 
I don't think I ever saw the finished product, just the scenes that we did. Yeah, it was on Showtime at Gregory Hines. It was really, really good. It was almost Hitchcockian. God, I gotta, I gotta find that and watch it. Yeah, it's probably on YouTube or something. Um, Red Line. Oh yeah, that was more. That was when I came up to Portland. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was um, a couple of guys that I went to high school with. Um, they they started a production company and started doing these really low budget kind of car crash movies. Oh yeah. You know, the same thing they were doing in high school, you know, wrecking stuff and you know blowing stuff up. So um, they got, I got this call from one of the guys and they said, hey, you want to score this thing and. The, I would have loved to, except I didn't really have any gear at the time. I had just moved up here, didn't have a home studio, mm-hmm. um, at least not, you know, worth <laughs> one that you could score a movie with. Uh, and then this uh, buddy of mine that I met up here, Craig Crothers, is an excellent songwriter, and he had a home studio, and he said, well, why don't we just do it together? We'll just split the money. Yeah. I went, all right. <laughs> so I called him up, and they said, yeah, that's, that's great. So we just started, they started sending us up. You know, this is sending us up videotapes. We'd score the scene and send them, send it back to them. It was all so hard. Everything was so hard back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you had to put stuff in a, in a, you know, actually in a mailbox and send it, and then get it three days later or whatever. <laughs> and now you just kind of drop box it to someone. It's, you know, it's just so much freaking easier. Yeah, and that was also at the time when Jim Michael Vincent had his um, his accident where his face got fucked up. <laughs> that, I don't mean to laugh at the guy, but yeah, when we first saw him in the movie, mm-hmm. went, what's going on here? And yeah, he had smashed his face up because he's drunk. Yeah. And and went through the windshield, and, and they said, oh, when, when they got the call, the filmmakers got the call, they were like, Dude, so he's not going to do the movie? And they go, no, he wants to do it. So they, they somehow wrote it into the story that he just survived an assassination attempt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, around that time, uh, I remember me and my dad saw him on Howard Stern's E! show, and he he just looked so bad, you know. And there was a rumor going on that he killed a cat or something, and he said, I didn't stop no kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Weird dude, man. Yeah, I mean, back in the 70s, I mean, he was huge. He was like, you know, the, the the handsome stud that, you know, every girl wanted. But then at some point, you know, everything just went south. You know, when he was doing that series Airwolf, you know, he drank a lot and all that stuff, unfortunately. Yeah, I, th- I heard that he was just, his alcohol problem was just legendary. Yeah, I mean... Um, when he let's see, when he passed away, my friend, my friend Terry, who was at, who had a small part in Big Wednesday, she went to his funeral and she uh, she got a picture with Gary Busey and William Cat, you know, because you know she knew them on that set and everything, and she hadn't seen them in over fifty years and stuff, or forty wow. years. Yeah. <laughs> um, you two were with the um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on their Six Flags tour, right? I, I didn't actually tour with them. Um, I did the music that they that the guys in the rubber suits toured to. Was that the the Out of Their Shells album? Yeah, I had it. You do your research, dude. You had that. I had it. Okay, when I was yeah. six, seven, eight years old, I was the biggest Ninja Turtles fan. My seventh birthday party was all Ninja Turtles merchandise. You know, banners, hats, cups, everything was Ninja Turtles at my seventh birthday party, and. Uh, my mom bought me that album, and I, I just I was shocked to find out recently that album sold three million copies, and it was, uh, I mean the music was good, don't get me wrong, but it was so freaking cheesy because it was just to entertain kids. <laughs> totally, and and boy, I I never saw a nickel of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, you know that was a funny one because uh, I have a friend named Brian who's a, a at the time was a producer and engineer. Yeah. And he used to work at this studio a lot called Conway Recording down in L.A. Really great place. And he somehow met this guy named Papa Jean, who mm-hmm. basically he was like an idea guy. And his idea at the time was he wanted to license, uh, license the turtle name uh-huh. and, and create this tour in this album. So he, I don't know exactly how you do that, but that's the kind of stuff he figured out. So he's from New York. 
and he was talking to Bryant about it, and he said, you know, what I need now is a songwriter. And Bryant said, I got, I got this guy, Jim Walker. So I went over to the studio when, he was, when Bob was in town, and we met. And within 10 minutes, we were writing these songs. Pizza power, you know, like just <laughs> throwing, throwing stuff out there. I mean, I was a little too old at the time to really fully appreciate the Turtles. Yeah. And I, I could only get sort of a vague sense of what we were supposed to be doing. But we had a great time. We wrote these songs pretty quickly. And then we went to New York and, uh, and recorded. And that was a whole other experience. But um, yeah. it, was, it was a super, super fun. And basically it was the three of us, Bryant and Bob and me. And every once in a while we'd bring somebody else to come in and play. And one of the oddest choices that they had was there's a jazz drummer named Bobby Previtt, mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the best jazz players ever. And somehow they got it in their head, like, we'll have Bobby come and play on it. And Bobby had just scored the, um, like the Moscow circus that was happening that year. He just, I mean, he spent, you know, a couple of years mm-hmm. doing this big orchestral score for the Moscow circus. So he comes in kind of in total avant-garde mode. Mm-hmm. We're like, yeah, can you play this? Boom, boom, bap, boom, boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, boom, bap, because that's about all this needs. And I don't think he understood the, 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 the note. You know, it, he just, he really wanted to just play and get a bunch of jazz stuff going on in there. And, and we were like, that's really not the right vibe. You know, it, it needs to have nothing but totally simple stuff. But it just wasn't where he was at. And I remember we got, him and I got, <laughs> got into it, mm-hmm. got into this huge argument. And they ended up having to <laughs> have these guys come in who I swear to God were connected guys. Yeah. And these guys came into the studio and basically separated us and told Bobby, this is what you're going to do. You're going to play it like Jim tells you, or you can leave. Yeah. And it was just this weird kind of good fellas Sopranos moment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was just another another experience where I'm just standing there going, "What in the hell is going on here? Why yeah. am I here?" <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's it's a um, nostalgic memory for me <laughs> from my childhood. <laughs> I did go to um, Magic Mountain though and see the show, which was really fun. I felt so bad because it was like 102 degrees. And these poor bastards are in these rubber suits dancing around on stage, and I just thought, oh my God, they must be dying in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like the, uh, the, you know, the people who work at Disneyland and stuff. <laughs> oh, God. Did you, so did you end up seeing the tour? I did not, um, but yeah, I had the album. I had, I, you know, my dad took me to see all the movies. I, I watched the show every day. It was just, it was a huge part of my life. But no, I never got to see the official tour. I think I may have had like a copy of of it on on VHS or something, but I can't remember. Because I do remember seeing it, or maybe I just saw clips of it on TV, something like that. But I, but yeah, I never actually got to go to the show. So how do you beat Tim Ellis and form Tim and Jim? That was when I. One of the things I was doing right before I moved up to Portland, when I still lived in LA, was I was singing jingles. And I worked with this company called um, Ad Music, and a bunch of great guys, and I was making a pretty good living as a jingle singer <laughs> back in the day um, until I, I guess I'd been flavor of the month long enough and then no one hired me for a while so uh, what commercials the, did you do uh, there was one for a lot of stuff for beer okay Ham's beer Coors yeah. Budweiser uh, High C um, oh god I did so many things back then a lot of mobile messaging kind of stuff, like uh-huh. pager, pagers, because that's what they had back then. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so um, I was. I told the guys at Ad Music. I said I'm gonna move up to Portland. Just you know, kind mm-hmm. check it out. And they said if you're going up to Portland, you should meet this guy whose name is Reed Ruddy, who owns a studio up in Seattle called Bad Animals with a heart, which heart. Uh, yeah. So. I was like, okay, I came up to Portland. I called this guy. He couldn't have been nicer. He said, why don't you come up to Seattle? It's like a two and a half hour drive from here. And I was like, okay. So I went up and met Reed, 
super nice guy. Gave me a tour of the studio. Pearl Jam was recording something in there when I went up. And he was super nice. The thing he said, you know, I can't really do anything to help you in Portland, but the guy you should talk to is this guy, Tim Ellis. And I said, okay. So I found Tim's number. He was the, he was a studio manager at a place called uh, uh, Whitehorse. Mm-hmm. And I called him, and he blew me off for months. And, and then finally, one day, I get this call, and he's a very, was very much like an uh, alpha male. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, what do you need? And I said, hey, my name is Jim Walker. I just moved up from uh, L.A., and I just, I'm just i trying to meet people. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Anyway, and just basically got this blown-off treatment. Um, yeah. And, and once I met uh, some, this other songwriter that I did Redline with, Craig Crothers. Mm-hmm. So Craig and I were... Uh, had had worked together on did you ever when you were a kid did you ever see the We Sing shows the what shows they were, they were called We Sing it's mm. kind of like almost like Barney it was like a mix of giant puppets and people I'm sure I did <laughs> so it was a kid show and they produced it out of Portland and they'd been doing them for years and uh, the one we did was called um, Into the Sp- out of the sea or something like that. It was a sea theme, ocean theme. And uh, so I got cast as a puffer fish named Spike, who talked like this. Hey man, what's up? And then Craig got cast as a giant octopus, who talked like this! Yeah. <laughs> and that's how, that's how we met. And then I didn't even know Craig was in a band for a long time. And one day he said, hey, come and see my band. I said, all right, so I show up, and who's the guitar player for Craig? It's Tim Ellis. And so then I kind of met these guys and they asked me to play keyboards in the band and we did that for a few years and then Craig ended up moving to Nashville got a publishing deal in, in Nashville and so Tim and I were kind of left together and we were like you want to just do something together yeah mm-hmm. and that turned out to be like the best thing ever like 22 years of playing with this guy he passed away in 2016 unfortunately yeah but we had a, a ball together for just years and years and played all the time like four or five nights a week and uh, never a never a sour word between us. Drank oceans of booze. Had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> you you guys got to play with some iconic bands. Uh, you guys got to play for uh, Crash Test Dummies, Lover Boy, The Temptations, Four Tops, Boss Gags, Warren Zevon. Man, that is just mind boggling. Any good stories about those guys? You know, we normally we opened for those bands. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> they. They usually had their own dressing rooms and stuff like that. But um, I think the funnest gig we did was with Little Feet. Yeah. Um, we opened for them two nights, one night here in Portland, and one up in Tacoma. And Fred Tackett and Tim knew each other. So we were just hanging out with Little Feet. And those guys, talk about a bunch of crazy motherfuckers. <laughs> and they were so much fun. And great stories, great guys. Um, yeah, it was just a super fun little weekend hanging with hanging with the feet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure the Motown the Motown guys were cool and they had stories, but you probably didn't get to interact much with them, right? No, they were, and you know the the Temptations were sort of like the version of the Temptations that were playing then. Yeah, it was like I think one original guy and then like a bunch of their sons. Oh, were in it. They all sounded they sounded great. But, and the other thing is <laughs> normally. Tim and I would have a gig either before or after. So we'd probably blow in at the last second, do a quick sound check, do our set, and then phew, we're gone. Off to wow. something else. That was just the way, <laughs> the way it was back then. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I, I, don't know, um, I don't know where I found the energy back then for yeah. that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Let's talk about the new album. I'm gonna say I'm gonna go say hi. How long did it take to write and record this? Um, I would say a couple of years. Just worked on it, kind of on and off. Not really super steady. I I kind of tend to work on just work on songs, not toward an album or anything like that. And then mm-hmm. I'll find oh this one works with that one, and that one works with this one, and all of a sudden I'm then I'm working more towards a goal of an album. But yeah, that was a couple of years of um, just kind of, you know, picking away here and there mm-hmm. until something kind of emerged. So, yeah. Yeah, was it like a COVID project? 
the, the no, that one was I think a little bit later. But the three albums before that, those mm-hmm. were definitely COVID projects. I mean, when I was was kind of isolated, nothing was going on. There was no place to play. Yeah, uh, I was just in the studio all day long, just working on stuff. Mm-hmm. People, uh, people like uh, what the final result was and stuff. I've gotten some good feedback on it. Yeah, I mean, people, people tend to. It's a weird, it's a really, really peculiar thing now because, you know, you used to have people when you like, I don't know, sell CDs for instance. You know, usually people would come up and buy a CD from you off the bandstand, and you have yeah. a little conversation, you know, or something, and they'd come back the next week and go, "Man, I like that song. Well, great, thanks." <laughs> but even in this wealth of information that we have right now like I'll bring out an album and I won't hear anything from anybody but then I'll look and I'll get my <laughs> my uh, my statements oh this song had 17,000 plays last month they're like what? who's listening to it? why don't they say something about it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a yeah. really strange sort of disconnected uh, experience it is it is it's the strangest time for anything, you know. The, the the you know we have all this 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 technology in front of us. And there's so many people, particularly the young kids, who just don't utilize it. Right, right. You know. And are, do you play music too? My dad had a band when I was a kid. He tried to teach me to play guitar, but I was never successful at it. So no, I'm not a musician by any means. I'm a really bad karaoke singer. That's about it. <laughs> But you've obviously got uh, such a love for movies and music. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've dabbled in acting. I did stamp comedy for 10 years and stuff. So, yeah, I'm a lover of the arts, for sure. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. It's, and I love talking to, you know, I love talking to other people who are, you know, musicians and who are just fans of art in general, because it's not something I really get to do very often. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean... <clears throat> There's a lot. There's a lot more of us out there than one would realize. You know, people who love music and 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 movies and television and so forth. You know, and I just wish you know they lived in my hometown so we could hang out every day. But at least I get to meet them on the internet. You're right. Right. Exactly. So, that's, so, I'm, oh, go ahead. It sounds like you've got a great thing going with this with this uh, this show. I mean, I was looking at some of the you know your past interviews. They look real super fun, and I've listened to some stuff. That, Sounds great. So six six years of this has just been the biggest blessing of my life, and I'm wow. trying I'm trying to put a memoir together and everything, and talk about this stuff and do all that. It's just it's 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 a wild ride that I, I'm just loving, you know. Terrific. <laughs> so, so, are you doing any live shows or anything like that? Right now, I've been uh, I've after Tim passed away, um, I really wanted to take a break. Mm-hmm. So I took a break for, I wasn't really sure how long I was going to take a break for or what I was going to do. Um, but I ended up just sort of like, every time I think about like, well, maybe I should start a little band or put something together. I'd, I'd imagine like loading the car up with a PA system. And right. I go, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of didn't end up doing it. Um, and then just at the point when I was literally like, okay, now I'm really going to do it. COVID hit. And kind of knocked everything down for a while. Um, but right now I'm playing with um, a singer-songwriter named Michelle Van Cleef. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting experience because we're not doing any, any of my stuff. And I'm, I'm singing a little bit, but mostly playing guitar. And I'm, I'm kind of filling the role that Tim used to play, uh, fill with me, mm-hmm. um, where I'm playing sort of the color on top of the song and trying to add the right, you know, the right feel behind the song to, you know, just kind of accentuate the stuff so it's a it's kind of coming at music from the opposite way that I've had been coming coming to it uh, but that's and that's been really fun playing with her and she's a great singer great songwriter so yeah we're working on uh, we just finished we finished one EP I think last December and now we're working on another one right now nice anything else upcoming um, I've got this uh, kind of strange ambient album called Northwest 2 that's, uh, that is about to come out. It's like a and Brian Eno type of ambient? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. it's just, I'm, I'm calling it like sort of sound bits. You know, it's stuff where you, it's not like you have to you sit and listen to it. It's more like stuff while you're doing 
something where your brain needs to be occupied. Mm -hmm. Music you can have on in the background while you do that. Yeah, you also do voiceover, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I've done that for years and years. Well, for mostly video games and commercials and all that stuff? Yeah, um, a, lot of, a lot more commercials these days than video games. But, yeah, I did a, I did a video game uh, back in the, uh, the mid-2000s or something yeah. uh, called Star Fox. Uh, Star Fox Assault. And it was this Nintendo game, and I didn't know anything about Star Fox or any of that stuff. So I just auditioned for it, and I did my own voice because I didn't, didn't think I was going to get it anyway. And they went, yeah, we want to hire you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I did this thing, and that was another thing. Like, there are people that have no idea that I make music or do anything other than the fact that I've done the voice for Star Fox. I get these, like, you know, people that were kids in the mid-2000s that love that game. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so I've, I've done a couple of interviews like this one, but completely about Star Fox. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Weird little trajectory going on. Watch, I'm sure at some point you're going to be asked to do Comic Cons because of that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I, yeah, like, you never do. Like I said, you know, and you'll have like all these different fans from different things, you know. Like, oh, you did that song, something to remember me by. I, I love that, you know. Not just the the Star Fox, but you know, you'll get recognized for that, and you'll have your horror fans from Mirror Mirror and Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird, it's a a, a weird, uh, a weird career. Yeah, but it's 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 eclectic, and it's been a wild ride for you. And boring, I'll say that. Yeah, <laughs> and I thank you so much for coming on today, Jim. I, I will keep uh, an, an eye out, you know, for your Instagram posts and stuff. I love getting notifications that you like my dirty memes I post. <laughs> I love them, man. They're great. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I got friends on Facebook and Twitter who post the stuff, right, and I just steal, steal it from them and put them on my Instagram because they're that, they're that hilarious, you know? <laughs> Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, and uh, I, I, I'll see you on Instagram. Absolutely. You have yourself a, gr a great rest of your day, and be safe out there. You too. Take care, bud. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, there you have it. Jim Walker, ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a down-to-earth cool guy, and who would have thought he's a nerd too when it comes to this stuff, and I'm glad we got to talk today. Go check out his new album. I'm going to go say hi. I guess it's available on his web website, uh, jvamusic.com, and that's about it. So till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes.